Welcome to the city. I'm Anthony Wilson, the public information officer for the city of San Angelo. And joining us for the full episode today is the state representative from San Angelo, State Representative Drew Darby. Thank you for being with us. It's my pleasure, Anthony. It's always good to be with you. Thank you. So the one piece of legislation that state lawmakers must pass during each biennium, of course, is the state budget. And yes. uh, during this past biennium or past session, the state budget was approved at $209 billion. That was an increase of a little less than 4%. In your mind, what are the highlights of that budget? Well, it was actually 3.8%, and uh, we left about $3 billion on the table, and we have a healthy rainy day fund. So uh, I think we were judicious in how we spent the money. I think we filled some of the holes that we had dug in previous uh, sessions. Uh, public education is one of those. Uh, we were able to put back in not only the growth uh, in schools, uh, but we also put another billion and a half dollars into that. Uh, I think that was much needed. We had an opportunity to perhaps try to fix public education funding, but uh, the Senate was not open to that to the plan, so that went by the wayside. Uh, we did a lot of great things, including increase our spending for border security to about $853 million. I think we were able to, for the first time in a number of years, uh, give each college campus an opportunity for tuition revenue bonds. I think we restored a lot of the formula funding for higher education. Angelo State was a recipient of that. Uh, in fact, uh, they got a, about a $20 million tuition revenue bond. Uh, so that was good. Um, I think we were able to help the um, uh, employee retirement system, put some money into that to make it more actuarially sound. We were able to fix in the supplemental budget a teacher retirement system health care, TRS care, uh, because of the Affordable Care Act uh, with the United States government it has had a dramatic effect on the escalating costs of health care for a lot of our pensions and retirement systems and we put about $700 million into uh, the TRS uh, care package. Uh, at the same time, we gave property tax relief. Uh, we gave about $4.2 billion in, in franchise tax relief. And, uh, and then another initiative we put on the ballot is uh, increasing the homestead exemption. And so all of that, uh, when you consider a growing state and you hear all kinds of figures about anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500 people moving to Texas, uh, job uh, plentiful here, low employment. Uh, I think we accommodated the needs of a growing state, a rising need for health care uh, and the costs associated with health care. Uh, I think we're able to fix all of that and yet balance the budget. Unlike the federal government, we can't spend more than we bring in and, uh, and we did so, I think, well under what the constitutional spending limits are. And I think we can be proud of this budget on behalf of the state this time. Among your responsibilities in Austin, you serve on the House Ways and Means Committee, which handles tax and, and property appraisal issues. And you touched on this just very briefly in that prior answer, but one of the bills that emerged from that committee will be on the November 3rd ballot as Proposition 1. Explain what passage of that constitutional amendment would mean. Well, it would mean an additional $10,000 homestead exemption, resident homestead, for every uh, person in the state of Texas that owned and lived, home, lived in that home. Uh, they would have an additional 10000 exemption in addition to the 15000 they already had. Now, that will mean some difference for individual property owners here in Texas. It will uh, certainly give, hopefully, some relief to their uh, tax burden. Uh, and so that, that cost, it, with it comes a cost, and the state has to reimburse school districts across the state for this additional exemption. It'll cost the state about $900 million, coupled with the $8.1 billion that we've given in previous uh, election cycles. And so uh, I think it's, we're, we're all concerned about rising uh, property taxes, but it's a function of other factors that the legislature cannot control one of which is the increased value of people's homes throughout the state. Now, who would object to having their homes go up in value? We all want that. But with it comes a higher valuation and 
for tax purposes, you take the valuation, multiply it by the rate, and that's what an individual homeowner pays. And so we don't control values and we don't control the individual tax rate. So while we're giving this exemption, uh, I am fearful that it will be short-lived and people will not see an extraordinary savings in their, in their taxes and perhaps appraisal creep and perhaps tax rates will outstrip uh, this exemption. But sh should we do it? Yes. That's all the legislature could do, and so I would recommend that, that folks approve that. But there's a hidden factor in that also. Um, because you have transfers of real estate here in Texas, uh, some have advocated that we ought to tax that. We ought to put a sales tax on the transfer of real property here in Texas. And so what's also on the ballot is a prohibition against the state ever taxing a transfer of real property here in this state. And I think that's an important constitutional prohibition that would be included in Proposition 1 that we're, we're trying to get approved by the voters in November. Those two together, I think, is, is worthy of support uh, by the folks listening to this message. In addition to serving on the House Ways and Means Committee, you also chair the House Energy Resources Committee, which oversees legislation related to energy exploration and, and production. And there's obviously been a downturn in the oil field here uh, in the past year. What's the forecast for, for West Texas oil production and how do you think that's going to impact San Angelo? Well, you know, in, in, in a lot of respects, we're victims of our own successes. And because we had a need, we had a need to find more production in this world because of demand. Uh, we had new completion techniques with fracking uh, that, that came into existence and opened up uh, uh, horizons and pay zones that had never been thought profitable before. Uh, the industry went to work and they, they found new reserves and, and new production and in effect tripled the production of, of oil and gas in Texas. Uh, with that brings more supply, more supply and if, if economies throughout the world remain relatively uh, stagnant and not growing then the more supply you have the downward pressure it makes on, on pricing and so uh, with that, we've seen a dramatic drop in the price. We almost 60% uh, uh, or 100% uh, was gone from the 90s down to below 40 uh, this week. Uh, so that continues to bring challenges. Uh, you're going to see a lot of consolidation in the oil and gas industry. Uh, you've seen it in the service-related part of the oil and gas industry. People have had to adjust their rates in order to remain competitive. We've, we've seen downsizing, people have lost their jobs. But an interesting thing, uh, because production is so high, the state gets a severance tax associated with the severing of oil and gas from below the horizon. And so our severance taxes have remained relatively high. And, and people have seen gasoline that you pay in the pump go from nearly $4 down to in some cases below $2. That means that there's more disposable income in people's pockets, so they're spending that money, they're buying things. And so with them buying things, that, reduce, that results in more sales taxes. So we've seen our sales taxes remain very strong uh, in this period of time. Uh, you know, I'm fearful that uh, a prolonged price uh, structure below 40 or below 50 for that matter will see uh, even less drilling rigs working in this area, less jobs, uh, uh, less royalties payable to uh, landowners throughout West Texas here. Uh, and so I, I think that will affect the budget projections for the next session. Uh, and so I'm waiting for our controller, Glenn Hager, to make those projections. So uh, I see a period of uncertainty here and and hopefully Texas is more diverse than we've been in the past. We've been, here in West Texas, we've been through a roller coaster from time to time on boom bust. And uh, I'm hopeful that our economy is diversified to the point here in the state that uh, it won't be as impactful. A prolonged price decline will not be as impactful 
to the economy as it's been in the past. Of course, transportation is also closely linked to oil production uh, here in Texas. Talk a little bit about what was done during the session in order to improve highways in our region. Well, that's another thing. Uh, you, you, that's another proposition on the ballot. I, I'm very active in trying to make sure that we have proper and adequate transportation funding for this state. And, and what I've personally been involved in in the budget process to make sure that if you have money supposed to go into Fund 6 to fund roads and asphalt in Texas, that we don't divert it for another purpose. Well, we have been paying DPS, Department of Public Safety, out of Fund 6. Is that a legitimate policing power for the state? Yes. But can we find alternative sources to pay them, not out of asphalt money? And we did that. We found that those, that money, and it's about $1.3 billion over, over the biennium. We also, with the voters' approval, last fall approved Proposition 1, which took a portion of the severance tax dollars that would have flowed over into the rainy day fund, and we diverted those into the highway fund. That's a good thing. Now with Proposition 7, we're going to take an additional anywhere from 2.5 to 2.9 billion dollars and say we're going to if sales taxes are above 28 billion dollars we're going to take the next two and a half billion dollars and flow it over into fund six for highways if uh, motor vehicle sales taxes exceed five billion dollars then we're going to take 35 percent of that excess and move it into fund six for highways Altogether, that will give us enough money to give to TxDOT to make sure our congestion levels remain where they are today. It's not, they're not going to improve congestion throughout the state of Texas, but what we're trying to do is maintain what, what we have right now. And I think we've made good strides on that, and I would ask everyone to get out and approve Proposition 7 uh, so that we can complete the task of giving resources to our Department of Transportation. We're talking with State Representative Drew Darby, and we'll be back right after this. Ludwig Havelock, I'm 92 years old. I was born in November the 3rd, 1921, at Loweke, Texas, and I flew uh, 43 missions on this B-24 over 613 combat hours. Okay, I started off in April 1944. April the 3rd, we landed in Guadalcanal from the state. We came from the state. We took one of these B-24s from Langley Field and flew it all the way to Guadalcanal. And then uh, we started flying out of there oh, in about a oh, month or so. We started uh, flying missions over the Pacific, uh, the islands the islands that the Japs were still on, that they owned the Japs. We'd go there and bomb them. And first of all, I flew five missions with a crew, with a high altitude crew, and I, I was a tour gunner. I flew specializing in a tour gun at Harlington. I went to Harlington and specialized in a tour gun. But then I went to radar school too and specialized in radar. So I flew five missions, and after they found out I, I was radar, they took me off of the uh, high altitude and put me on the snooper squadron with radar. So I handled later on from then on, on 38 missions. Because we snooped at night, that was our, we started in the morning. I mean, we, we was briefed at four o'clock before, before we took on a strike, and that it took off that just when the sun was setting. And, and we come back, the sun was just coming up, rising, 12 hours. Ago. My job was to uh, the, stay with the radar uh, and tell, tell if there was any weather up front or if there was any objects on the ocean or any object coming in from either side. That was my job. Up to the target, about 20 or 30 miles, then the bombardier would take over and he would uh, uh, think, uh, you know, get on the course and, and we dropped the bombs. If, uh, when, in the meantime, I would have to leave the radar and go mount the gun and handle the waste gun. And after, after we got over the target, uh, the, I stayed on the waste gun. Well, it reminds me of a lot of things. It reminds me of where I stayed and where I, you know, where I had to... I, my outfit was right on top of that bomb bay, you know, and then bombs was right under me. <laughs> Mm 
Welcome back. We are continuing our conversation with San Angelo State Representative Drew Darby. And I want to talk a little bit about what is obviously uh, the most pressing issue here uh, in San Angelo, and that is water, which was a real focus of the uh, prior legislation, uh, legislative session, not so much uh, earlier this year. Why was that? Well, we, we did a lot of great work uh, about around HB4, which is a major initiative that, that took many sessions and a lot of interim studies to to work through. And so we implemented four, which created the State Water Infrastructure Bank, among other things. And uh, then the voters approved a $2 billion transfer out of the Rainy Day Fund into the State Water Infrastructure Bank. Now what that does, that gives cities like San Angelo and other rural communities, and urban communities for that matter, the opportunity to uh, have a funding source that gives below market rates to uh, the city to help advance those projects forward. And then that money is repaid with interest and it's loaned out again so that two billion over the next 40 years will grow to about 50 billion dollars in uh, needs and projects for the state. I think that's important work. I actually serve on the as one of the three members of the Texas House on that Water Infrastructure Bank Advisory uh, committee and so uh, I am I'm careful to monitor and make sure that those projects are lent out with the expectation and the statutory language that we put in 10 percent of that money has got to go to rural projects 20 percent has got to go to conservation measures and so uh, my my role is to make sure that that money goes out San Angelo would be a potential a recipient of some of that money. I think we're in the queue uh, for a wastewater treatment facility, which I think is absolutely critical for the future needs of this community. Um, everyone complains about water rates, but the, the truth of the matter is we live in a, in a water poor region and water is expensive and, and we need to understand there's a difference between simply the cost to uh, uh, allow water in our lakes to flow down the river to our treatment facility and we pay to clean it up and distribute it and that's a cost but there's a very different cost that if we have to go get that next water source deliver it to San Angelo and then transport it and treat it it's still it's going to be more expensive but the cost inter uh, differential if you will is a it's called availability Water departments in San Angelo's, just like the rest of the water departments in the state of Texas, they pay, it, it, it has to be a revenue source. The revenue from users has to pay for the service. Not only do we pay for the cost to operate the system, you've got to pay for the availability factor to have water there. The truth of the matter is nobody's going to move to San Angelo, Texas unless we have an assured water source, not only for today, and not only through our emergency water system with the Hickory Aquifer, which is simply a, a bankable uh, reserve for emergency situations. We need to be looking at that next project out, and I think wastewater treatment and what it would deliver, we already own the water. There's, there's a huge debate in Texas as to who owns the water. Well, San Angelo owns its wastewater, and we can treat it use it, reuse it over and over again. It's available to us, it's right under our nose. All we have to do is treat it. And I think it is a project that must move forward. And my role uh, in connection with the Swift Water Infrastructure Bank is to make San Angelo is fully considered for uh, the state help with regard to that project. Of course, you know that the city of San Angelo is working with uh, the cities of Midland and Abilene as part of the West Texas Water Partnership in order to try to develop a long-term regional water source. I'm interested, is that on the radar uh, down in Austin? Oh, what absolutely. Do, what Let do me, lawmakers make of that? A absolutely. I, you know, it shows collaboration, regional collaboration, which is critical to the survival of communities out here in rural Texas. We don't have the population centers. But what we do, we raise cattle, we raise crops. Last time I checked, they don't have beef cattle at the back of HEB. They don't raise cotton in the back of the men's warehouse. We have to have people 
to live in these areas, to, to man these resources so that people in urban cities can use those resources. And so when Midland and San Angelo and, and Abilene get together, they're looking for that next project out the 30, 40, 50 years out that will bring us regional collaboration to get this next project on board and get state help in doing that. It's a lot easier for me to sell to the folks down in Austin that this satisfies a regional need. Not only if you help San Angelo and Midland and Odessa, you help Abilene. I mean, you help Odessa. You help Snyder, Big Spring, Ballinger. You help all the communities in this area. It makes it easier as a regional uh, uh, resource to get the appropriate legislation or the appropriate uh, help financially uh, that this type of project is going to need. And so I'm very supportive of that. I would encourage everyone that uh, is listening to this broadcast to support this type of initiative because it makes us stronger together. We are not competing with regard to Midland and, and Abilene, really, we should be cooperating with them to work together to find that next source. You mentioned one of the, uh, the coming fights is who owns what water. Do you foresee the legislature addressing groundwater rights in the near future? Uh, that's one of those uh, third rail in politics. Uh, we've got a lot on our plate for the next session, whether it be public education, uh, uh, some other hot button issues. I think groundwater has to, it, it really has to work itself through the process. Several years back, we went to a model that allowed groundwater districts to do local and regional planning, uh, to move their plans forward and, and to know what needs to happen in the future. Uh, I think we need to work through that process. HB4 was only done a couple of sessions ago. We need to let that bill work its way through. And so I don't see groundwater as, uh, as a topic of real intense uh, legislative scrutiny in the next session. You noted a little earlier that uh, $21 million was authorized for Angelo State University, and that's going to be used to build a new College of Health and Human Services. Talk about what you think that'll mean for ASU and maybe even for its goal of reaching 10,000 students. Oh, let me tell you, I'm so proud of ASU. I mean, they had dramatic increase in their enrollment. A lot of, some of it is due to the dual credit initiative that Dr. May uh, started with the help of the uh, Carr Foundation. Uh, but they're doing the right things at Angelo State. They're providing a resource and, and a, an asset to, the, to West Texas and throughout the state of Texas for that matter. This new health uh, building will provide a focal point, if you will, to move those services within the building, but it'll also free up space uh, that, uh, that has been needed for their engineering school and some other important uh, missions of Angelo State. Uh, it, it, the, Angelo State is a vital, important economic engine for San Angelo and West Texas. It is an integral part of the Texas Tech University system. They value Angelo State, and Angelo, va Angelo State values being a part of that system. And so anything we can do to help Angelo State grow, I think Dr. Heinemann had a study one time shows every student in Angelo State results in about $45,000 worth of economic input to this community. Well, that's a lot. Of, when you take and add 3,000 students at $45,000 a student, that's millions of dollars worth of economic input. They got to live someplace, they got to drive cars, buy things. Um, uh, we don't get as much impact, obviously, from a dual credit course, but we get that student that has hours at Angelo State say, well, wait a minute, maybe I can go to Angelo State and get my college, four-year college degree. Maybe I can go there and, and get a nursing degree or uh, and, and will trigger their mind, hey, I succeeded in this dual credit course and I've got 12 hours or 15 hours. I only need another three years, three and a half years at Angelo State. So I, I think it's a, it's a wonderful thing for this community and it's a, a tremendous asset and anything we can do to help Angelo State uh, move forward, 
forward with its vision, I am supportive. On a sort of a more of a statewide uh, scope, there was a lot of uh, focus uh, during the past legislative session on the open carry of, of handguns, and it received a lot of attention. Is there any reason that citizens should feel nervous about that? I, you know, I don't think so. This was kind of a gun session. Uh, it was on everybody's mind, and obviously there have been some developments recently that, uh, you know, brings the issue into focus. But, uh, you know, I would submit that these, these incidents occur in, quote, gun-free zones. They're not anybody shooting back. And, and, and when somebody shoots back, the situation is stopped. I want to, I, I'm a big believer in, in folks being able to, to take advantage of their Second Amendment rights. Uh, I think, um, I think it, the more we can do to allow people to protect themselves, I think the better. I think uh, we, we went through an open carry uh, debate uh, for CHL permit holders. I don't think that's really gonna be an issue. Not one CHL permit holder I know is gonna openly carry. Uh, but they wanted the ride in case their jacket flew open or exposed their gun some way. Uh, we're in a debate right now about campus carry and where where would be a, a gun-free zone on the campus. Public universities have to go through a process to listen to their students, their faculty, their regents. They'll come up with that plan and it's going to be inter interesting to see how those plans develop and we may or may not need to re revisit it in the next session. What do you think is going to be some of the priority issues in the next session in 2017? Uh, uh, public education. I mean, that's going to be the top of it, I believe. It depends on when the Supreme Court decides. Sanctuary cities, one of the incidents, I think, in San Francisco it related to a uh, crime spree by an illegal immigrant. So. Uh, I'm sure we'll look at sanctuary cities here in Texas to see if there are uh, either acts of admission or acts of omission. There are environments that don't uh, allow law enforcement to properly ask questions about uh, uh, the, the status of folks in that community. So I think sanctuary cities would be another one. We've been talking with the state representative for San Angelo, Drew Darby. And we hope you'll join us for the next episode of The City.